Yeah, definitely. Uh, the idea was, uh, does giving a uh, infusion of uh, intravenous magnesium prior to intubation, about 15 minutes before, um, and I believe they're using a 50 milligrams per kilogram dose, um, would that improve intubation conditions in patients to the point where maybe we don't need to new use a neuromuscular block? <laughs> to the Overruns Journal Club, Ed Bowder and Dan Schwester here on another Magic Monday. And today it's uh, today it's going to be Magnesium Monday, Danny. That's what we're going to be doing today. Um, uh, paper came out in 2023. discussed the use of magnesium uh, for facilitating intubation, which was kind of interesting because it's not really something we talk about in our formulary a lot. So uh, this paper is coming out of Tunisia, which is a faraway land. Um, kind of a small sample size, about 76 patients once we actually get through all of it. But let's, uh, let's go through the beginning and the intro, Danny, and then we'll, uh, we'll get to the meat of this paper. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the idea was, uh, does giving a uh, infusion of uh, intravenous magnesium prior to intubation, about 15 minutes before, um, and I believe they're using a 50 milligrams per kilogram dose, um, would that improve intubation conditions in patients to the point where maybe we don't need to new, use a neuromuscular blockade? Uh, all of these patients did not get any paralytics. Um, and again, it's a small sample size, about 76 people, but kind of interesting results. And it might have some impact down the road. So let's get into it. Yeah. So what they did was they mixed 50 milligrams per kilogram of magnesium into 100 mLs of normal saline uh, about 15 minutes before the induction of anesthesia. Now, just some quick caveats to throw out there. This was done. All of these intubations were done in what are called ideal settings. So these are in hospital, um, usually much controlled environments. They were healthy patients. So not a lot of the, um, not a lot of the variables that you would see in, in an EMS setting, but the important thing about this paper is that this is something that's probably going to be relevant in the next couple of years, um, really harnessing the action of magnesium sulfate uh, in these actual trials. So the idea was they would bring in these patients. Now, and again, this is a double blind randomized trial, which is kind of the, the uh, gold standard here. That's what we're looking for. Yeah. So they randomize these patients. There's a flow chart down here that actually shows how the randomization went, which I always like. So we had 84 patients that were uh, eligible. And then that got brought down to 80 patients and there were a couple exclusions. So that led us with 76 patients. There's 38 in each trial arm. Um, again, pretty good, uh, you know, pretty, pretty decent mix of patients. The average age was about 45. Um, and then they, they went into a whole bunch of different parameters here, but we just kind of want to get the sort of the 10,000 foot view here. So what they were talking about here is we see magnesium minus, which is these are the people that did not receive magnesium. And over here we have magnesium plus patients that did. And over here where we see patients that needed ephedrine, this would be essentially epinephrine uh, in the field. And we can see that patients that did not receive magnesium generally needed more epinephrine uh, during their resuscitation. So the conclusion for this paper, they include that mag sulfate is an effective drug uh, to use as an adjuvant for tracheal intubation without needing neuromuscular blockade. Patients receiving IV magnesium experienced easier laryngoscopy and better intubation conditions with 95% clinically acceptable conditions in the magnesium group. The dosage used in this study, 50 mg per per kg did not cause any significant adverse hemodynamic effects or post-operative compl complications. And this approach could be beneficial, especially for patients unable to use neuromuscular, neuromuscular blockade options. So why this paper? Who cares? <clears throat> after, <laughs> after, after going through all that, um, so the way that magnesium works, when we give it a calcium channel blocker, when you're giving it uh, to vascular things. So giving magnesium, at, making it work as a calcium channel blocker, is it sort of kind of, it will relax the vessels, right? Now, this might seem counterintuitive because we don't want to relax the vessels too much to cause the patient to be hemodynamically unstable. But one of the things that giving mag will do is because we're stabilizing those calcium channels, it might actually reduce the effect of the other drugs that we give. So these patients who receive mag, may be less capable physiologically of lowering their blood pressure. Now, again, this wasn't done in groups with paralytics. Um, you know, we saw some fentanyl derivatives given in this case, but we didn't see, you know, your, your classic RSI type medications. They didn't get sucks. They didn't get rock. Um, so there, there's a couple different variables with this, but I, I like the idea of pre-medicating with mag just to try and keep the patient's hemodynamics regular and keep them normal. Yeah, and I was really impressed that the intubating conditions were very good after giving magnesium as opposed to the control group. 
Uh, they seemed to have an e easier laryngoscopy. The vocal cords were, uh, you know, in the right position. Uh, generally, the conditions were very good. Um, again, this, like you said earlier, this is a study. I don't know how much it's going to translate to EMS right now because these were very healthy people undergoing semi-elective operations who are hemodynamically stable, not really the patient we see out in the field who is pretty sick, uh, on the cusp of respiratory failure or hemodynamically unstable. And, you know, obviously the next step would be to study it there and see how it works. But it does have some interesting applications for us down the road of maybe in a patient that might be a little bit more difficult airway or somebody we don't want to use paralytics on, this could be a possible option and it's something for us to pay attention to. Right. And how often do we talk about situations where, you know, this patient is experiencing this type of ailment and it precludes them from actually being RSI, right? We can't give a paralytic because their blood pressure is 100 systolic or 105 systolic. Or, you know, we can't give this, uh, this opiate analgesic because if we do, it might bottom the pressure out too much. And I, I think there's at least a theory that we, we might actually be giving too many pharmacological interventions, right? So, you know, we have these patients who are sick and we're worried about whether hemodynamics are going to lay and we give them all these vasoactive drugs and then we worry like, oh, what's going to happen to their blood pressure after we give them all these medications that are designed to lower their right. blood pressure. And then, you know, after we give all these medications to lower their blood pressure, we're going to do a laryngoscopy, which is further going to lower their blood pressure. So th this, this paper sort of supports the argument that I think we've heard a lot over the past five, 10 years, which is, supports that resuscitation before intubation type of mindset, right? But maybe this is extrapolating out a little bit further where you have a patient who I think we're going to intubate them. I don't know that we're going to, but it's one of those patients that like, they're kind of leaning more toward intubation than not, right? And this could be like your closed head trauma, you know, you're really sick, asthmatic, you're really sick COPD patient. And in those settings, especially people who are going to go into respiratory failure, MAG will also have the added benefit of having a little bit of bronchodilatory effect too, right? Because it's going to yeah. relax the muscles that are around the bronchioles. And, you know, there, there was a time where the standard treatment for refractory asthma involved, you know, terbutaline and epinephrine and, mag and, and magnesium. And it's, per, it's still pretty much first line. Yeah, and, and, and it should be. Um, I remember there were arguments years ago, like we should just start with mag on asthmatics because, you know, <laughs> we just, why not? Um, and of course the concern with that is, you know, causing an electrolyte disturbance kind of down the road. But I, I, for, for our purposes, it's not that I'm not worried about electrolyte imbalances or, or whatever else um, down the line, but if my patient isn't breathing, then I'm not really some, I'm not really interested in, in lab values, you know, like magnesium is a positive cation. So it's going to drive like negative ions out of the cell space. But, you know, for, for that 25 minutes that's going to happen, I'd kind of rather get the patient's airway back. I think the interesting thing to take from this too is the risk. Look at magnesium. It's, it's the fourth most common mineral in the body. Um, everybody can have it. Nobody really has a, there's really very little sensitivity to it because it's already endogenously in your body. Um, there's no downside to giving magnesium. Um, we know that it tends to potentiate beta-2 effects when we give a beta-2 agonist. Um, we know that it helps in preeclampsia. Um, again, this is a pretty benign medication. It does not cause a lot of major problems. And in the dosages we're going to be giving it at, I don't see really a downside. No, and I think that's right. And then, you know, if the concern is for an arrhythmia, I mean, MAG is a drug that we're giving for ventricular arrhythmias anyway. Um, you know, and, and not to, and I don't want to say like, oh, you know, give MAG. MAG is the, is the new, you know, it drug. MAG is the new ketamine. <laughs> um, you know, but it does, there's so many things that we can use magnesium for. And, you know, it, talking to more like holistic healers, they'll tell you magnesium is good to sleep. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, of decent uses for it. I just don't know that we've used it effectively. And, and I wonder if it's almost in the same category as calcium at this point, where, you know, these are drugs that we know work and, but because it's not epinephrine or because it's not rocuronium, 
we're kind of just dismissing it. And, you know, not at, at the risk of, uh, you know, turning into more of like a woo woo thing than I want it to be. You know, is it possible that maybe sometimes we're using too many drugs and not enough, you know, uh, I, I hate to say supplements, but, you know, a drug like magnesium, if it has all these effects, is it possible that maybe using mag could be more effective than using some of the paralytics we use? I mean, maybe I still think there's a place for paralytics and I think paralytics are going to be first line for quite a while in EMS, yeah. especially yeah. pre-hospital care. Sure. On the other hand, this is, again, this is something that has not a lot of downsides. Looks like it has a pretty good upside. Um, I would love to see some agencies take this uh, paper as a basis to go to their IRB and let's study it. Let's look at it in the field and see if it works for us right. because if we can make it safer and better for patients, that's a win. Um, yep. Maybe that patient, maybe there are patients that don't need paralysis. They need some magnesium for a little relaxation, better mm -hmm. intubating conditions. And we do okay there. Um, I think that's where we're going with this. I think that's right. And then again, getting into the meat of the study, this is a double blind uh, trial, 50 milligrams per kilogram prior to any anesthesia, which might be a lot. That might be more magnesium than you actually carry on your truck, uh, right. which might be another variable that we'd have to control for. But yeah. Again, so for a hundred, hundred kilogram person, that's going to be like what? Five grams. Yeah. Around there. You need, you need a lot. It's more, like I said, more, more than you carry typically. Maybe. Um, which, which might be part of the problem, but you know, the ages of these patients were between 20 and 65, which is your perfect cohort. Most of the patients that we see pre-hospitally that would fit uh, someone who could get magnesium probably over the age of 65. Um, this went on, this study went on for six months through April and September of 23. So this is pretty new data. And again, they, they go into how the, how magnesium actually works, right? It antagonizes your NMDA receptors. Um, and essentially what that's going yeah. to do is it's going to decrease your catecholamine secretion and that's going to decrease vasodilation. So you, when you're giving these drugs, this kind of adds magnesium adds acts as an adjunct uh, where it's going to stop right. further vasodilation. So this might be one of those, uh, one of those cases where, you know, you have those, the borderline intubation patients, right? Do you know, years ago, it used to be like, well, do I give this patient CPAP or do I intubate them? And now it seems kind of like, well, We've decided we're going to intubate this patient for whatever reason, whatever sequela they have. And based off of that, all right, I don't know that this 85 year old who, you know, has been taking whatever prednisone her whole life uh, or their whole life, and they've been taking aspirin and they have hypertension and all these other problems. It might be that, you know what, I, I worry that I'm going to intubate this patient. Let me go ahead and pre-dose them with mag, which is going to control their vasodilation. It's going to control, do, um, it's going to help their, their muscle cramps and all that kind of stuff and generally have kind of a benign effect. And maybe that magnesium and those vasodilatory effects actually kind of help the patient in that setting, or we've now pre-medicated them to make the intubation a little bit easier for us. Yeah, yeah, who knows? I mean, this is again, and this is something we talk about almost every Monday, right? Is we need to do more research. We need more pre hospital focused research. And this is a good springboard to jump into that because the data here is good. It was a randomized control trial. Remember, that's the gold standard of, of research here. It was double blinded. There's really not a lot of bias here that I could see from this paper. And the results, even though for 76 people, it's still a pretty good number. It's not too small. Um, again, I'd like to see this expanded. I'd like to see us play with this in the pre-hospital world. I'd like to see some agency pick this up. And it's a pretty, it seems like, again, no, not a lot of downsides possibly a really big upside and could be the start of something new in EMS that would help our patients. And one of the things I really like about this study is the last line, because uh, it talks a lot about healthcare team outcomes. It talks about an interprofessional approach involving clinicians, mid-level practitioners, pharmacists, nursing staff, uh, collaborating activities and openly sharing case information will provide the safest and most successful patient care. And I, I think that's true, right? Like we had to go, we had to go to Tunisia to find this information. Um, it seems to me that further that there's countries like England or, you know, the, U, the well, yeah, the UK, um, United States, Canada, uh, certainly Australia. It seems like we could get some pretty good data out of this. Um, but again, it, it depends on people who are willing to do it. So in this is one of the things that we've talked about a lot in Journal Club, Danny, is that this is if you've seen one study, you've seen one study. And this yeah. this is this is one I tend to think good study. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I just kind of hope that it works to build on, a, on further things here. Now, the other thing is there are side effects to magnesium, just like there are with any other medications. Um, this will be linked in the show notes as well. The stat pearls that Mary Allen and Sandeep Sharma wrote, um, really, really good overview of how magnesium works. It's worth the read. Uh, under their adverse effects, they talk about cardiovascular collapse, respiratory depression or paralysis, and I'll share the screen with you guys here just so you can see it. Um, there are some concerns when you're actually giving magnesium, but a lot, again, this cardiovascular collapse, respiratory depression, paralysis, hypothermia, uh, depressed cardiac function, pulmonary edema, all that stuff. Most of those are dose, dose and administration dependent. So, and similar here with the flushing, vasodilation, all that. And we've talked about this with previous medications too, where you have to know how you're giving your medication. Now, magnesium typically comes pre-mixed and pre-bagged. So this isn't really a big, we're not going to bolus magnesium. But you have to be aware of it if you do have a different packaging that this isn't something you can just take out of Bristo and just kind of slam into them. It's also not something that you want to just fly in wide open. This is something you want to give on a pump so that you know how much you're giving and you know how much time it took to give. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that's where you get the the worst adverse effects on this. Um, you you could conceivably hurt somebody by you know giving it in, inappropriately or giving too much too fast. But listen. You, you can, you can hurt anybody with anything too much, too fast. Right. I mean, yep. you know, too yep. many hot dogs, too, too fast. fast, got a problem. Um, Oh, they're coming out July 4th weekend. That that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> too many slurpees too fast. Too, you got, you know, brain freeze. I mean, these are the things, Yeah. but again, you know, again, this is, this is how they gave it seems to be safe and reasonable. Um, the results are pretty good. They're pretty encouraging. It doesn't change my practice yet, but it's something that I would probably show my medical director and be like, Hey, this is interesting. Yeah. And this is one of those, like, and again, this is, you know, the, the yet thing, right? So if you're working in a system that's protocol driven, this is something that you're going to have trouble doing. Um, but if you are in a system where you have a medical director, who's a little bit more thoughtful, a little bit more advanced, this is something you can get thrown into your algorithm where, um, you know, you have your patients who are borderline, let's say patients who are between the ages of whatever, 20 and 65, put it, take it from this study where you're looking for patients who are intubatable, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or whatever, who are, uh, who fit the mold for intubation. Um, and you're trying to find people who are like, all right, well, if I give this to, you know, an elderly patient, I know that there's going to be an adverse effect on their catecholamine drive. I know that I'm going to super paralyze them essentially. So why not premedicate them with mag and try and give them a better shot than they would have had with, you know, just a paralytic and a sedative. Um, I, again, I, I don't know that it's practice changing for me, um, but I do think it's an interesting thing to kind of keep in the arsenal. This is where, you know, you have those dynamic RSI patients, your dynamic arrests, and it's kind of like, uh, you know what, we're, why don't we throw that into the bag of tricks anyway, just to, and, and I hate to, to be so glib as to say, just to see what happens. But, you know, if you have a patient where the options are, they're going to keep breathing or they're not going to keep breathing, it, it seems to me more effective to try and keep the patient breathing. Yeah, I agree. I think it's safer for the patient down the road. Uh, we we do know the inherent risks in RSI. Uh, we generally balance that with the benefit of securing the airway and taking over the patient's uh, breathing function. You know, but there's times when that may not be the best option for the patient. And I think this would give us something else in our armamentarium. Uh, again, it's not something that's going to jump out and change my practice right now. It's something I'm going to look at and it's something I'm going to hope that other people look at and start studying. Yeah, and I think that's right. And that's a good place to leave it. That is this week's journal club for the overrun Ed Bowder and Dan Schwester. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe in one of those little things that pops up here ish on the screen. Uh, everything will be linked in the show notes. Be sure to like, and subscribe on YouTube and listen to the podcast whenever you get a chance. And for the overrun, I'm Ed Bowder. And I'm Dan Schwester. And we'll talk to you next week on magic Monday, everybody. <laughs>